Good evening. I'm Lacey Ford and I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and it is my pleasure to, to welcome you all this evening to this lecture. I'd like to welcome everybody on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences by describing it as a place where students come to learn the wisdom of the ages and marry it with cutting edge scientific knowledge and the spirit of innovation to solve the problems of our still relatively new 21st century. And I think we will are be in clear presence of the wisdom of the ages during this lecture this evening. One of the great things about being dean of such a large and diverse college is as a, just before coming over here this afternoon, I was listening to a medical doctor talk about type 2 diabetes to students in a global studies health cafe. And then I come over here to listen to a theologian talk about the human consciousness. This is a pretty fun job, actually. Uh, uh, it certainly keeps your intellectual curiosity sated. Uh, many of you know that I am a historian by trade. And there was a time when there was a lot more dialogue between theologians and historians than probably occurs today. But even during the course of my historical career, an enorm probably the single most important book that shaped my view of human history was actually written by a the theologian, and it was Reinhold Niebuhr's The Irony of American History. It's written in 1952 or so, 50 or 52, and in broad terms it was a book cautioning Americans not to be terribly confident they were absolutely right about the Cold War. Uh, not that he had any use for communism in particular, just that he wanted everybody to understand that evil was radical and universal and not concentrated in any particular part of the globe, but it was a profoundly deep and influential book if you get beyond the context for, for which it was written. So I am always enjoy the insights that theologians have to offer, so I'm, I'm glad that we're all here this evening. Um, there's one quotation from, from that book of Niebuhr's that I think is always appropriate to share with audiences, and, and I'm going to share it with you now. In it, he says, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, that humans have just enough capacity for justice to make democracy possible. And we also have just a strong enough inclination for injustice to make democracy necessary. Uh, I think we live in a time where the two sides of that are, are quite obvious. And uh, we can be thankful for such insights. So welcome. I'm going to turn over the podium uh, to Jim Kutzinger, retired professor of religious studies and former chair of the department, a chair's position that is so important I still haven't been able to fill it on a permanent basis, but I've had uh, very good interim uh, chairs at, to introduce our speaker. But again, welcome, and let's consider what we hear tonight as wisdom of the ages to be applied in our own lives and, and to the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Lexi. A number of years ago, before he elected to move even further south, the eminent scholar of Judaism, Jacob Neusner, stopped by to visit here with my religious studies department colleagues and me about the possibility of joining our ranks. He decided, among other things, that winter temperatures in Rhode Island, where he'd been teaching at Brown, were no longer to his liking. We were naturally flattered that someone boasting a scholarly record like Neusner's would even consider an appointment in a tiny, undistinguished department like ours. In case you're not familiar with his work, Wikipedia calls Neusner, and I quote, one of the most published authors in history, having written or edited more than 900 books. 
It was therefore with a certain anxiety, not wishing to put him off, you know, that we asked the great man what sort of additional demands on our limited operational budget he might anticipate requiring. <laughs> Nothing comes to mind, he said. And then after a slight pause and with an ironical look on his face, he added, except, of course, the cost of asbestos envelopes for my correspondence. I couldn't help but recall this line when considering how best to introduce our speaker this evening. Epistolary exchanges with one's fellow scholars are today seldom written on paper and sent through the snail mail. So there's considerably less demand for flame retardant materials to ensure the safe arrival of a specially critical review or rebuttal. But were such precautions still necessary, and were they extended not just to letters, but to the many other genres of communications we academics employ, I can think of no one whose prose might in this way be better served than Dr. David Bentley Hart. Now, my audience may find this a surprising, perhaps even insensitive assessment to offer when introducing the very man in question. Indeed, our guest may himself be wondering where exactly I'm going, though I suspect he's the least concerned in the room. <laughs> My comparison, I assure you, is meant to be altogether complimentary, and at the same time illustrative of an important principle. At a time when many of the intellectual class seem in retreat from the rough and tumble of genuine philosophical argument, when rhetorical salvos of the kind needed to awaken one's interlocutors from their dogmatic slumbers are worriedly thought to be displays of one's tactlessness, Dr. Hart may well be considered a champion, not just of those who agree with him, but of those who, though they miss, may disagree, can nonetheless appreciate the dialectical and rhetorical prowess of a relentlessly tough-minded challenger. Someone, in fact, precisely like our speaker whose often pungent critiques of the scholarly and cultural status quo, and whose occasionally offensive defense of provocative claims are always advanced with an understated good humor and implicit invitation to respond in kind. Mind you, I say this as someone who does mostly agree with Dr. Hart. He once described himself as a, and I quote, post-Kantian, post-Nietzschean, semi-Heideggerian, universalist, crypto-perennialist, confessionally Eastern Orthodox cynic from Maryland. When I first encountered that list of epithets, I found myself checking a yes, to, a yes in all the boxes, except cynic from Maryland, since that's not where I'm coming from, either geographically or temperamentally. Nevertheless, even if he and I weren't so apparently alike in our views of what is, I would still say the same. The Academy needs more scholars in need of asbestos envelopes. Not to mention, perhaps, fewer administrative restrictions on commitments, claims, and questions which might, however inadvertently, prove discomforting to the epistemologically complacent and the politically supersensitive. We could also do with a much larger helping of people with our speaker's extraordinary range, which includes philosophical and systematic theology, European philosophical discourse from ancient times until the day before yesterday, and Asian religions. And with his equally enviable stylistic facility, which one finds on persistent display, not only in his witty cultural commentary on some of the most pressing issues of the day, but in his more demanding scholarly work, focused for the last several years, among other things, on the metaphysics of the soul and philosophy of mind, his subject this afternoon. I'm not sure what else I can usefully add to the synopsis provided in the program, except to say that I too see no reason that there couldn't be fairies, and every reason to think not only that the historically much maligned origin is probably a saint, but that his universalist proclivity is thoroughgoingly orthodox. But for more on that subject, you'll have to attend Dr. Hart tomorrow morning when he lectures at Trinity Episcopal Cathedral on the question, as everyone saved, universalism and the nature of persons. As for his talk here today, 
I invite you now to sit back and enjoy what I expect to be a sometimes trenchant, often poetic, always erudite exploration of the prerequisites and perquisites of human consciousness. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Medley Hart. Gosh, I should have prepared something better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I just hope the uh, pitch of expectations hasn't been set so high that I'll, I'll uh, inevitably disappoint them. But, but thank you, it's very generous. But you didn't mention my fiction. Uh, well. I hold that against anyone. So. You could have been one of that lucky three or four human beings who's read it. You know, so. The devil and Pierre Genet. Well, okay, I take it back. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be in South Carolina. I'm not at all troubled by the weather because I just came from Indiana, uh, which is the lowest circle of hell at the moment. Usually it's next to lowest, but um, uh, this is actually quite balmy by comparison to the winter winds uh, sweeping the upper Midwest. Uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, it's funny, I'm, I'm here talking on two topics, this and tomorrow's topic, uh, that uh, invariably, uh, when I talk on them, I get questions from the floor in which I'm asked to fill out all the details of the project I'm describing. So I'll tell you now, I can't do that in either case. Uh, the book that tomorrow's lecture concerns is at the press now, and the book uh, to which these reflections will, will contribute uh, is in a slow process of gestation. Uh, but let me explain, uh, actually, what... what, what uh, I didn't give the title to my lecture, Dr. Kotzinger did. So, uh, but he, he gave it the right title, at least the right subtitle, The Conditions of Consciousness. The project I'm engaged on in, in uh, the area of philosophy of mind, which is a fairly ambitious project, in its negative moments, its initial moments, is a rejection of physicalism as a metaphysics, and especially as an explanation of mental events. More specifically, it's a rejection of the idea that the, uh, of the notion that mind can be defined as simply an emergent process of brains or neurological systems. And in a sense, uh, I, I should have perhaps written the book a little earlier because the tide of philosophy of mind has been turning in that direction a bit in recent years, and I don't like being in the majority. And it continues to turn in that direction at the, ma at the moment, no matter how fiercely uh, certain materialist prejudices of academic philosophy continue to try to steer the skiffs back in the opposite direction. The problem, however, with making the argument that I, that, that I will want to make in the book, and th this is especially the case in the Anglophone world, is that many of those who attempt to enter the debate are unwilling or unable to distinguish the logical problems of the question of consciousness and intentionality, that is, the mind's capacity to be about uh, ends and objects and purposes, from the empirical question of cognitive science and the correlations between brain activity and mental events. These are two very different sorts of questions. And another problem, again, especially acute in the world of Anglophone philosophy, is the habit of imagining that the only alternative to a straightforward emergentist narrative of consciousness is a kind of Cartesian dualism. Uh, but, of course, actually, uh, that sort of dualism, like uh, a mechanistic model of, of mind, uh, is one of I mean, these are equally modern mechanistic pictures of reality, and both suffer from, if not exactly the same logical deficiencies, very very similar logical deficiencies. And so, first, one has to isolate the proper question before one can attempt any answers. Simply said. And I say this simply by way of, as I say, isolating the correct question. There is no way in which the sciences, as we understand and practice them, 
can supply any information of particular relevance to the question of consciousness aside from reminding us, as we know, that minds and bodies are not functionally severable in our normal experience. The reason for this is banal. Consciousness, uniquely, is not a third-person event reducible to a purely objective description, but is, a first, but is first person in its phenomenal structure all the way down. The mind can't be exhaustively accounted for solely in terms of the mechanics of sensory stimulus and neurological response, if only because neither stimulus nor response is by itself a mental phenomenon, neither as a purely physical reality possesses conceptual content, intentional meaning, or personal awareness. In truth, though, even the most basic phenomenology of consciousness discloses so vast a qualitative incommensurability between physical causation and the subjective experience of mental events that any method capable of providing a model of only the former can never produce an adequate causal narrative of the latter. The two sides of the phenomenon simply cannot be collapsed into a single observable datum, at least not one observable in, the sa in a single way, or even connected to one another in a causal narrative, and so the precise relation between them can't be defined or even isolated as an object of scientific scrutiny. And this is an epistemological limit that it seems reasonable to th think will not be erased no matter how sophisticated our knowledge of the complex activities of the brain may become, because the problem is one of logic, not of method or technique. The problems with the materialist account of consciousness, however, are far graver than the limits of scientific method. I'm not going, however, to lay out for you the whole inventory of those problems, because that would take us a little over time by about 72 hours. <laughs> But I have to uh, note that the most obvious phenomenological contours of every mental act, its subjectivity, its unity of apperceptive aptitude, what's called its aspectual and volitional intentionality, its uh, qualitative awareness, etc., that is, its ability to be aware of things under the forms of qualitative experience, such as hot, cold, or are precisely all those things that early modern method banished from its view of nature in order to perfect a method of pure third-person inductive investigation. Well, there's nothing contempt contemptible in that. And of course, the original picture of things that was thus produced in the 17th century largely by making this methodological deci deci uh, decision was quite contentedly dualist, allowing the mental and the physical each its own discrete autonomous sphere. Nature, not being teleological or intentional in any way, it was, it was believed, at least as an object of, in, of inductive investigation, is nothing like mind. Mind, not being composite, purposeless, and impersonal, at least not as we experience it, is nothing like nature. Now, as problematic as this was logically for describing any kind of coherent ontological, causal, or epistemological liaison between the two spheres, it was nowhere near so magnificent a disaster as the later materialistically monistic attempts to reduce mental events to mechanical. Hence, now, after so many really extravagant philosophical failures, I say it's really, it's actually an almost poignant history, uh, and again, I would lay it out for you if we had several days, or if this were a class rather than an rather than a simple single lecture. We're at a moment when the choice is narrowing down to two extremes. The first is panpsychism, that is the proposition that consciousness is not emergent from matter, but is merely a ubiquitous property of all physical events, in the way that, say, mass or... or uh, uh, momentum might be, in various degrees of integrated or compound or amplified function, uh, as proposed, say, by Galen Strawson, or more hesitantly by David Chalmers, or even by the great neuroscientist Christoph Koch, who used to be a believer that a in, in, in a physically reductive account of mind, and for many was expected to be the neuroscientist who would really begin to solve the problem. This sort of panpsychism, or various kinds of panpsychism, are present in the ascendant. That will probably pass, because my experience of philosophy of mind is it goes through cycles. 
Uh, at the moment, panpsychism is all the rage again. But understood as a materialist doctrine, I'm, I'm entirely sympathetic to a different kind of panpsychism, but understood as a materialist doctrine, panpsychism ultimately answers no questions. It merely defers the question of consciousness to the subatomic level, where presumably it'll grow so very small that it will vanish away altogether without any further effort of thought on our part. The second option, the second extreme option, is eliminativism, uh, whose high, high priests are, are a married couple called the Churchlands, but also uh, the very, so I'm sure many of you have heard of Daniel Dennett. Ultimately, I think he fits into this category, or the philosopher Alex Rosenberg, or many others, which remains a kind of default option for the truly avid materialist philosopher who's given up on a cogent account of consciousness as we think we experience it emerging from matter. And this is the claim that there is no such thing as consciousness at all, and no such thing as intrinsic intentionality. The mind may seem to be about things, uh, but the, and that seeming may seem to be about things, but it's all an illusion at the end of the day. It will, in fact, prove to be an illusion of grammar in all likelihood, as well as of certain recursive functions of its own operation. And in principle, would, should one day be displaced by a comprehensive physicalist narrative that will reduce all the apparent aspects of consciousness to discrete physical, molecular, electrochemical events without any phenomenological remainder. Both options are ultimately absurd though I'm going to defer that discussion to another time, or to the book. And anyway, all the other proposed materialist solutions, wherever they are located along the continuum between these two extremes, are every bit as preposterous. They just seem more reasonable. And But again, I'm, I'm not going to, to list them for you now. I'm going to just focus on one issue tonight, for the remainder of, of, of my lecture, which is the most basic conceptual difficulty that any but those two most extreme solutions to the question of consciousness must overcome. And this is simply the extraordinary vagueness of the concept of emergence or emergent properties as it is used in the sciences, especially in evolutionary biology and neuroscience, as well as in the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of science. Because emergence is a concept that, as generally employed, verges, I think it's fair to say, on the nebulous. Talk of emergence does seem to provide a convenient way of evading certain problems without appearing to have done so, such as any apparent causal gap between the most rudimentary elements of life and the integrated complexity of organisms and ecologies, or between the objective electrochemical processes of brains and the phenomenologically radically disparate realm of subjective intentionality and experience without any reference to causes beyond the mechanical. That's its appeal. And it's a beguilingly simple idea. It's the simple, the limpid notion that there are in nature Composite realities whose peculiar properties and capacities emerge from the interaction of their elements or ingredients, even though none of those properties and, capac and capacities reside in the elements themselves in their discrete forms. An emergent whole, in other words, is more than or at any rate different from the sum of its parts. It's not simply the consequence of an accumulation of discrete powers added together extrinsically but is the effect of a specific ordering of relations among those powers that produces something entirely new within nature. And this proposition is quite true in a general sense. We observe it. It's called life. You, you may have noticed it. <laughs> they don't have much of that up in Indiana, but here. <laughs> but it's also a proposition that's almost certainly false in several specific and quite crucial senses. For if it is to close those uh, devilish explanatory gaps to which I alluded above, the model of emergence being employed must be one that allows for the appearance of a new physical reality that, 
though it remains ever dependent upon the, rel- the native properties of the elements composing it, must nevertheless possess new characteristics that are entirely irreducible to those properties. Every philosophy of the emergence of mind from matter requires the concept not only of emergence, but of irreducible emergence. But this is nonsensical. At least as a claim made solely about physical processes, organisms, and structures in purely material terms, it seems it can't possibly be true. If nothing else, it's a claim strictly precluded by the soundest traditional scientific principles. I mean, from a few purely physical perspective, there can't possibly be such a thing as emergent properties that are discontinuous from the properties of the prior causes from which they arise. Anything in, produ- in principle must be reducible by a series of geometrical steps, to use the term, proper term, you know, to the physical attributes of its ingredients. Water, for example, is composed of two very combustible elements hydrogen and oxygen, and yet it possesses the novel property of a capacity to extinguish fire. But while water's resistance to combustion is not identical with any property resident in either hydrogen or oxygen molecules, it is most definitely reducible to those special molecular properties that in a particular combination cause hydrogen and oxygen to negate one another's combustible propensities. If this, were, if this were all that was meant by emergence, then the concept would be as inoffensive as it is trivial. Problems arise when the idea is asked to explain away causal gaps in nature that more closely resemble the difference between, say, the physical elements from which a computer is composed and the purposes those elements assume in the computer's functions. A computer, after all, is composed merely of silicon, metal, plastic, electrical impulses, and so forth. And yet its operations are not only not present in any of its discrete parts, but are qualitatively different from any mere aggregation of the properties of its parts in some sort of total sum. But of course, what distinguishes a computer's powers from those individually possessed by its various elements is not any emergent property at all, but rather the causal influence of a creative intellect acting upon those elements from without. So while it's true that taken as a purely physical phenomenon, nothing that a computer does is anything more than the mathematically predictable result of all its physical antecedents, those operations that actually involve computing in the full sense have been formally imposed upon those physical constituents by a further, more eminent, informing causality, itself directed by a purpose, by a final causality that has assumed those physical constituents into a purposive structure that in no meaningful sense can be said to have emerged from them. At the purely material level, level, whatever is emergent is also reducible to that from which it emerges. Otherwise, emergence is merely the name of some kind of magical transition between intrinsically disparate realities. Something happened, and what do you know? Mind. To avoid these sorts of confusions then, you know, using emergence in a way that discreetly trespasses the boundary between the scientific and the magical, it really is necessary to undertake a kind of reconstruction of our concepts of causality. After all, you know, the extraordinary fruitfulness of modern scientific method was achieved before all else by a severe narrowing of its investigative focus. This is very very much in a sense the story of early modernity's scientific revolution. This involved the willful shedding of an older language of causality that possessed great richness but that also seemed to resist empirical investigation. At least that was the prejudice of the time. The first principle of the new organon was a negative one, the exclusion of any consideration of formal and final causes and even of any distinct principle of life in favor of an ideally inductive method purged of metaphysical prejudices allowing all natural systems, or I'm trying to check the time on my phone while I talk, allowing all natural systems to be conceived as mere machine processes. 
and all real causality is an exchange of energy through antecedent forces working on material mass. Everything physical became, in a sense, reducible to the mechanics of local motion. Even complex organic order came to be understood as the emergent result of physical forces moving through time from past to future as if through Newtonian space, producing consequences that were all mathematically calculable with all discrete physical causes ultimately reducible to the most basic level of material reality. And while at first many of the thinkers of early modernity, as I said, were content to draw brackets around physical nature and to allow for the existence of realities beyond the physical, those mind, soul, disembodied spirits, God, they necessarily imagined these latter as being essentially extrinsic to the purely mechanical order that they animated, inhabited, or created. Thus, in place of classical theism's metaphysics of participation in a god of infinite being and rationality, they granted room only for the adventitious, finite, cosmic, mechanic, or supreme being of deism, or, as it is called today, intelligent design theory. But of course, this ontological liberality was unsustainable. Reason abhors a dualism. Any ultimate ground of explanation must be one that unites all dimensions of being in a simpler, more conceptually parsimonious principle. Thus, inevitably, what began as method soon metastasized into a metaphysics, God help us, almost by inadvertence. For a truly scientific view of reality, it came to be believed everything, even mind, must be reducible to one and the same mechanics of motion. Those methodological brackets that had been so helpfully drawn around the physical order to allow for specific kinds of investigation now became the very shape of reality itself. It was always something of a fantasy, of course. For one thing, even as a method, the mechanical model extends only so far. Pure induction is an impossible ideal. In the life sciences, for instance, organisms can only very rarely be investigated without any hypothetical appeals to purpose whatsoever or without treating organic structures as intentional systems. What's it for? Cui bono? What's the point of this organ? And it's only a metaphysical prejudice that then dictates that the purposive language is no more than a useful and dispensable fiction. Moreover, before higher causes like form and finality could be excised from the grammar of the sciences, they had first to be radically misconstrued. Even such residual Aristotelian terminology, for instance, as remained in the sciences in the 17th century, had already to a very great degree been mechanized so to speak. You only need to read Francis Bacon to confirm this. I mean, it, it, instead of talking about the relation of act and potency in any event or any substance, we have talk of, say, agent and patient substances and interaction, and that interaction is understood as a mechanical interaction. This bears no relation uh, to the antique categories that are being used. Form and finality had come to be seen as physical forces or influences in extrinsic to a material substrate that in itself was not the pure potentiality, save prime matter, but, was, but merely a universal, subtle, ductile, unarticulated physical stuff. The elements of nature were not imagined, as they had been in the classical and medieval synthesis, as having an intrinsic disposition toward order or vital integrity. Again, this makes sense in trying to, trying to create an inductive method. The uh, elements of things were seen simply as inert ingredients upon which formal determinations were extrinsically impressed under the external guidance of final causes that operated merely as designs, factitious designs. Uh, that's why, again, something like intelligent design theory is a perfect example of an early modern uh, metaphysics reasserting itself and mistaking itself for an antique metaphysics. And so, seen thus, form and finality soon came to seem not only superfluous suppositions, but little more than features of an inferior and obsolete mechanical model. This mechanism was presumed. But of course, one can't really reject something one does not understand. 
neither Aristotle's concept of an aetion nor any, say, scholastic concept of a causa actually corresponds to what we, following our early modern predecessors, mean when we speak of a cause in a physical sense. I think a better rendering of aetia or causae in the ancient or medieval sense might be explanations or rationales or logical descriptions or still better rational relations. The older fourfold nexus of causality was not, that is to say, a defective attempt at modern physical science, but was instead chiefly a grammar of predication, describing the inherent logical structure of anything that exists insofar as it exists, and reflecting a world in which things and events are at once discreetly identifiable and yet part of the larger dynamic continuum of the whole. It's a logic, not a, not a science in the modern sense. It was a simple logical picture of a reality in which both stability and change can be recognized and described, and these aetia or causae were intrinsic and, in, and indisruptibly integral relations, distinct dimensions of a single causal logic, not separated forces, only accidentally in alliance with one another. A final cause, for instance, was an inherent natural end, not an extrinsically imposed design, and this was true even when teleology involved external uses rather than merely internal perfections, as in the case of human artifacts. It was at once a thing's intrinsic fullness and its external participation in the totality of nature. Thus, in the Liber de Causis, one of the... Uh, this remarkable book that uh, Thomas Aquinas and others uh, received from from the Muslim philosophical world under the fiction that it had been written by Aristotle, but Thomas uh, was wise enough to recognize that it was nothing of the sort. It was actually a kind of digest of the metaphysics of Proclus, the, the great Neoplatonist. In the uh, funneled through the uh, you know, Islamic monotheism. In the Liber de Causis, one of the principal causes of any isolated substance is the taxonomic category in which that thing subsists, the more eminent rational structure to which it belongs. So in a sense, a causal relation in this scheme is less like a physical interaction or exchange of energy than it is like a mathematical equation or like the syntax of a coherent sentence. Now, admittedly, this is a picture of reality that comes from ages in which it was assumed that the structure of the world was analogous to the structure of rational thought. But then again, this was an eminently logical assumption. If only because there appears to be a more than illusory or accidental reciprocal openness between mind and world, and because the mind appears genuinely able to penetrate the physical order by way of irreducibly noetic practices like mathematics and logic. In any event, perhaps it really was necessary to impose the discipline of this impoverished causal language on the scientific intellect, if only to direct its attention to the finest and humblest of empirical details. As I say, this is why modern science has produced such prodigies. But even so, as Hegel so brilliantly demonstrated, one can never really reason purely from the particular. Once the notion of causality has been reduced from an integral system of rationales to a, uh, a single kind of local physical efficiency, it becomes a mere brute fact, something of a logical black box. Description flourishes, but only because explanation has been left to wither. So it was that Hume, having seen the spectral causal agencies of the schoolmen chased away, all those things that the medievals and the ancients talked about, Hume found causality itself now to be imponderable, logically reducible to nothing but an arbitrary sequence of regular phenomenal juxtapositions. Even mathematical descriptions of events now became nothing more than reiterations of an episodic narrative without any clear logical necessity. And this is indeed where we remain, in a sense. Wherever induction fails to provide us with a clear physicalist narrative for especially complex or exceptional phenomena, like consciousness or life, we now must simply presume the existence and force of physico-mechanical laws sufficient to account for the emergence of such phenomena, and we must, moreover, do so no less than 
casually and vaguely than those schoolmen of old supposedly presumed obscure or occult, that's Hume's language, formal and final causes. We're no less dogmatic than our ancestors. We merely have fewer clear reasons for the dogmas we embrace. <laughs> the older physical logic was coherent, though speculative. The newer is incoherent, though empirical. When mechanistic method became a metaphysics and the tinted filter through which it viewed nature was mistaken for an unveiling of its deepest principles, all explanations became tales of emergence, even in cases of realities, and again I would say life, consciousness, existence, (laughs) where such tales seem difficult to distinguish from stories of magic. Nowhere is the essential arbitrariness of this picture of reality more obvious than in the alleged principle of the causal closure of the physical. So I'm having trouble with my phone here. I'm trying to keep, I don't want to keep you too long, but I, uh, I have a function that's supposed to prevent it from shutting down, and it keeps shutting down anyway. Someone's fault out there. The causal closure of the physical, a principle that so often invoked as a scientifically established truth on the rather thin basis of the fixed proportionality of matter and energy in the universe, among other things, but which is merely a metaphysical dogma and one that even otherwise sophisticated theorists have often translated into the crudest kind of physical determinism. I have known learned physicists who still talk as if at least once reality passes the threshold of quantum decoherence, something like Laplace's fantasy holds true. A demon of superlative intelligence, knowing at a given instant the precise location and momentum of every atomic particle in existence, could both reconstruct the entire physical history of the universe and foresee its entire future. True, these physicists might all have granted that statistical thermodynamics probably dictates that this would not be literally possible, but still, they spoke, and I'm talking about real people, by the way, uh, that I know at Notre Dame. Some of them are Christians, but nonetheless, they spoke as if, in principle, all events at higher levels of physical organization must be reducible without remainder to lower, more particulate causal moments. Hence, if our demon could somehow account for irreversibility or quantum indeterminacies, maybe by a perfect grasp of maximum entropy thermodynamics or by an occult knowledge of quantum hidden variables, he could, from the disposition of all the atoms and molecules composing me and my environment last Wednesday at noon, have infallibly predicted my presence here today because everything we do is the inevitable macroscopic result of the ensemble of impersonal physical forces underlying our formal existence. And yet all of us know this to be false. This is the special absurdity of allowing an artificial method appropriated to an isolated facet of reality, nature considered as a machine, which is to say nature considered as though devoid of anything analogous to proposive intellect, to hypertrophy into a universal judgment on all of reality, including those of its aspects, such as, obviously, instances of proposive intellect that actually exist, to which such a method cannot possibly apply in principle. To whatever degree I am a physical system, I'm also an intentional system whose mental events take the forms of semiotic, that is symbolic and interpretive determinations, and whose actions are usually the consequences of intentions that are irreducibly teleological. I got on a plane to come here. I don't like doing that. I'm not afraid of flying. I'm afraid of how small the seats have gotten and how big I've gotten. (laughs) As such, these intentions could appear nowhere within a reductive account of the discrete processes composing me as a physical event. Final causes are not visible within any inventory of the impersonal antecedent physical events composing me, described as third-person events. Simply said, I have reasons for being here, and reasons are qualitatively unlike mechanical forces, even when inseparably allied to them. Any good phenomenological description of my choice to be here would be one that could never be collapsed into a physical description of atomic, molecular, or even brain events. Yet, of course, at the level of the exchanges of... Yes, I'll agree with this. At the level of the exchanges of matter and energy, or of their interchangeable mathematical values, 
the natural order may always have to even out into an inflexible equation. I'm all for the conservation of energy. <laughs> but the movement of those material and energetic forces is also directed by causal or rational relations of a different kind, which impose upon the flow of physical events formal and final t determinations that are not merely the phenomenal residue of those events and that are not visible to those aforementioned physical inventories. Mm -hmm. The obvious physicalist repulse to this, of course, is to claim that all intentionality is in some sense illusory. We get back to the illuminativist position. Or reducible to complex electrochemical brain events, which are in turn reducible to molecular description and then to atomic description and so on, but that too is obviously false. It's not that I have the time here to argue the point comprehensively. So again, I defer the issue to my book. I'll simply note that over the past few years of my research in philosophy and science of mind, I've become more than convinced that every attempt to fit mental phenomena, that is, qualitative consciousness, unity of apprehension, intentionality, reasoning, and so forth, into a physicalist narrative has to prove a failure. Which, uh, again, is why we are at a moment where these two seemingly absurd extremes of panpsychism and eliminativism are the two most powerful philosophical parties in uh, philosophy of mind. If nothing else, mental intentionality in the full philosophical sense, not only of determinations of the will, but of every act of the mind in orienting itself towards specific ends, meanings, aspects of reality, and so on, is clearly a part of nature, and yet one whose irreducibly teleological structure is contrary to the mechanical picture. This is why, among devout philosophical physicalists, these wild extremes are au courant. Um, the mental, it turns out, is no more reconcilable to the modern picture of material nature than it was in Descartes' day. Nor, see how near I am to an ending here, a nearish. You didn't have anything to do tonight, right? No. Nor need we confine ourselves to the realm of the mental to call the mecha mechanistic picture into question. It may be that the conception of causality richer than this is already there looking us in the face. Uh, in th fields like molecular and evolutionary biology. Uh, at least this is where a more diverse causal language these days constantly seems to be attempting to assert itself. I have talk of top-down causation, circular causality, epigenetic information, symbiogenesis, teleonomy, convergent evolution, systems biology, even as a traditional genetocentric neo-Darwinism strives to contain that language within a more linear narrative and fails to do so. And this is not simply on account of the failure of the human genome project to yield the master key to the entire mystery of life from protein folding to my love of Glenn Gould or Ella Fitzgerald. That's what I was hoping they would find. <laughs> life appears to be structurally hierarchical not only because evolution is a cumulative process in which more complex levels are gradually superposed upon lower self-sufficient levels, but because every discrete organism possesses a causal architecture in which there can be no single privileged level of causation. This is sort of the doctrine of systems biology, which again is not a, a mystical doctrine. It's simply a, a rather interesting take on the empirical truths of the life sciences. Inasmuch as each level depends on levels above and below it, and none of these levels can be intelligibly isolated from others as a kind of causal base, as the primordial cause. At least such is the contention, say, of Dennis Noble, who's perhaps the subtlest champion of systems biology, or as he now calls it, biological relativity. There was a time, perhaps, when one could innocently think in terms of a master ground or center of life with the DNA molecule as the primordial genetic repository of information, and perhaps it seemed to make sense to understand life in terms of a simple dichotomy between replicators and vehicles the way Richard Dawkins does with those silly robots of his that are, you know, the, the, the shambling vehicles of the, those clever genes. 
Now, though, argues Noble, we can scarcely even define a gene, let alone identify a genetic explanation of the entirety of living systems. Nor can we ignore the degree to which DNA sequences or passive causes also variously informed and given expression as determined by organism and environment. And for Noble, there's a special kind of beauty in the exquisite complexity of organic life. He delights in the interdependent uh, simultaneity of life's functions, the way in which each level at once assembles the components of an immediately lower level while itself constituting a component of an immediately higher atoms, molecules, networks, organelles, cells, tissues, organs, holosomatic systems, complete organisms, populations, species, clades, the physical environment. He even daringly enough talks of natural teleology because he, he's sophisticated enough to understand that properly understood this is an intrinsic rational determination within a complex system, not a factitious purpose imposed from without by some deta detached intelligent designer. But in larger part because there clearly are levels of explanation at which purpose constitutes not just an illusory epiphenomenon of inherently purposeless material process. It's a real causal power. You can say it's an emergent explanation, but an organ, no matter how stochastic its history was phylogenically, exists within an organism because of the purpose it serves, apart from which it wouldn't exist. And these levels are not reducible to one another, but exist as a totality. Within the hierarchy of relations, there may be discrete levels of organization, but no independent causal functions. The entire structure is a profoundly logical whole. Now, maybe this intentional structure somehow emerges, as I say biochemically, phylogenically, from very primitive causes, which then become ingredients in a recursive system of interactions that were originally random or chaotic and is there st therefore still reducible to a state prior to purpose. But unless we're using the word emergence again as a synonym for miracle or magic, this is the point, we're still obliged to assume that the formal determinations of organic complexity, or as we now call it, their information, which is m more obscurantist than helpful, are clearly present in those causes in at least latent or virtual form, awaiting expl explication in developed phenotypes and, and other forms. And so we're obliged to assume that whatever rational relations may exist in or organisms, including form and finality, are already present in those seemingly random states. That is to say, we need not assume that prior to the complex unity of a living system, some extrinsic design existed within its material substrate like a kind of algorithm programmed by an intelligent desire, but we can't doubt that everything that enters into the structure of a living system is already constituted by those rational causal relations that allow discrete purposive systems to arise. Even if we can't say how life began or how self-replicating organisms became available for natural selection, we can certainly doubt that those higher causal relations are accidental accretions upon some single isolated aspect of their relations. Irreducible emergence is a logical nonsense. Whatever properties appear in an effect, unless imposed adventitiously, are already implicit in its lower causes even if only in a kind of virtual state. So even matter, if there is such a thing, in its barest constitution already has something of the character of mind. At least logic seems to urge even the materialist in that direction. As I say, panpsychism is also all the rage. And really, perhaps it's enough simply to consider the seemingly indivisible relation that exists between them in the very encounter between nature and mind, the intelligibility of the world and the power of thought to lay hold of it. Perhaps all we need to consider is how it is that the inherently formal and intentional structure of rational thought seems to correspond so fruitfully to the rational structure of the world. This by itself invites us to reconsider something at least like causal language proposed in Aristotelian tradition, say, or in others, in which, again, nature's deepest rational relations are more like the syntax of a sentence or a mathematical equation than like 
accidental concrescences of physical forces. Perhaps modern prejudice, prejudice has the matter backwards. Perhaps it's mechanism that should be regarded as the dispensable methodological fiction. While the proposive language we use to isolate specific organic functions are true reflections of reality. Perhaps mechanistic models never were anything more than artificial constraints by which discrete processes might be prescinded from a whole that in itself has something like the structure of intentional thought. After all, it's absurd to think that a model created by the willful exclusion of all mental properties from our picture of nature could then be used to account for the mental itself. And yet the mental is quite real and quite at home within the natural order. If then one presumes a reductively physicalist model of all reality but is then confronted by any aspect of nature that I believe as in the case of consciousness or intentionality, again, I wish I could lay out all the arguments for you, proves resistant to mechanical description. The only responsible course of action is to abandon or suspend the model in regard to the whole of nature. If the phenomenon cannot be eliminated, the model is false. Curious thing, though, about eliminativism and panpsychism, but eliminativism especially, is there they've decided that the phenomenon cannot fit the model, therefore the model must be retained and the phenomenon denied. We can't stop there either. Once again, a certain principle of logical parsimony asserts itself here, and then invites us, or even obliges us, completely to reverse our original supposition. Reason abhors a dualism, as I've said. I expected a laugh when I said it, but... <laughs> Ideally, all phenomena should be reducible to a single, simpler, more capacious model of reality. Far from continuing to banish mind from our picture of nature, then perhaps we should reconsider the ancient intuition that nature and mind are not alien to one another precisely because nature already possesses a rational structure analogous to thought. Perhaps the ground of the possibility of regular physical causation in the energetic and mechanical sense is a deeper logical coherence of rational relations underlying all reality, and hence mind inhabits physical nature not as an anomaly, but as a revelation of the deepest essence of everything that exists. The intentionality of mind then is neither a ghostly agency inexplicably haunting a machine, nor an illusion reducible to non-intentional and impersonal forces, but instead the most intense and luminous expression of those formal and teleological determinations that give actuality to all nature. What makes us believe we should, or for that matter, could think otherwise? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's probably a good idea. Is that... So Dr. Hart will um, entertain a few questions. I'm going to let him field the questions. I believe there's a microphone that will be right brought around. If you have a question, maybe raise your hand. I see someone back there, Shannon. And uh, we'll go ahead. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay. Is this on? Uh, thanks very much for your talk. I enjoyed that very much. Um, it seems to me that I could agree with almost everything that you say about the natural world and the need for something like a more Aristotelian picture, uh, something that we could call intentionality, purposiveness, form, matter, some sort of holomorphic picture. And, and yet, all of that seems still to me resolutely third person. And yet, you've characterized the sort of essence of consciousness, I think rightly, as involving something first person. And I, this is not the first time that I've been struck by what seems to me the overambition of the Aristotelian project with regard to, to consciousness. It, right. it just seems like it's a more adequate account of nature up to us. Yeah, I, I don't opt for an Aristotelian explanation of modern nature. As I said, this is just this opposing of the question about the modern division, uh, the separation of, of nature for mind 
presumed by a mechanistic model that becomes a mechanistic metaphysics. In the end, I'm not an Aristotelian in that sense. I don't think that that, that could possibly in itself close the gap between third person and first person explanation. What it can do, though, is close the gap between third person explanation of nature and the notion of intentionality as a, as a first person act. But at the end of the day, no, my, my uh, uh, this is just the posing of the question of early modern method and how it's brought us to a point where we're, we're posing for ourselves absurd alternatives. Uh, not because we've necessarily got the mind wrong. Phenomenologically, mind is a very simple thing to describe. Phenomenologically, I mean, it, as long as we're willing to allow that the descriptions, that, that, that there is such a thing as a first-person experience, which say Daniel Dennett, now it's Rosenberg or not. Uh, but describing nature in a way that then it makes some sort of intelligent, intelligible liaison between that description of, 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 of the phenomenology of mind and the nature from which it supposedly either emerges or that it inhabits like a ghost, well, that requires uh, breaking down the, 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 the premises, the set of presuppositions that bind us to a materialist or emergentist or dualist narrative. But you're right, I end up as a Vedantist, pure idealist, Neoplatonist, heretic. <laughs> I'm hoping we get excommunicated. <laughs> for your talk. I just wondered where you, you, you sort of invoked the possibility of like using biological systems theories in a way to sort of get into some of this in a different way. I'm just wondering where you would place these fairly recent theories known now as inactivism in the sort of uh, philosophy of mind within your binaries that you're creating, do you feel like there's a place for that theory? And in particular, right, these sort of um, notions of very basic mind that is without content. Mm -hmm. Therefore, really um, taking your notions of reason out of the picture yeah. and not, not making them necessary for some kind of intentionality Most, being there, right? Yeah. Um, so where would that fit into your, your larger uh, set of dichotomies? Right. Uh, I haven't decided because the literature is still evolving, but most of those that I've encountered uh, are in the, you know, the general family of panpsychist models that try to reduce consciousness to symbols that in composite become more complex, like an integrated information theory that you get from Giulio Tanoni and now Christoph Koch. To me, though, the phenomenology of mind militates against that rather violently in the notion that, that, that the actual act of consciousness can be a composite effect. I still think it is reducible to a simplicity of apperceptive uh, capacity and a simplicity of field of perception and, and intentionality. So to me, it looks like a, a still quasi-mechanistic language. But, uh, but again, as I say, this, line, this literature, this field of theory is still taking shape. In integrated information theory, which is sort of like a cousin, they, you know, there, there really is a failure, for instance, to distinguish between information in the sense of, of, uh, of, of an objective truth given, an objective quantity uh, susceptible of cognition and the knowledge of that. There's just, again, a magical transition where the third person becomes the first person without any explanation except accumulation. And to me, that's, uh, I think in, in the past, the term I coined for that was the pleonastic fallacy, the notion that if you have two infinitely qualitatively un, un, dissimilar phenomena, you can bridge the distance between them if you just have a sufficient number of tiny quantitative steps. Um, but as I say, I don't have a, a full answer for you. Oh, it's me. Okay, um, I'm going to take this from a pretty 
simplistic point of view, so this is probably way over my head, but there are a couple of things. I, I remember when I was a freshman in my first philosophy class, and, and when I looked at, at uh, quantum mechanics, I thought, oh my God, you know, there's, a, there's room for God there somewhere. So that was my big revelation. My interest in, uh, since then has been in risk and a couple of phenomena and systems theory. So a couple of phenomena that just come to mind, so to speak, are criti the critical state. So we have a we have a physical phenomenon, but within that physical phenomenon, there are there's an, sort of an infinite possibility of these critical states, like the sand falling down on the, on the little heap and then all of a sudden you get a landslide and you don't know whether it's a big landslide or a little landslide. The other thing is first order, second order, third order, fourth order phenomena. So I don't, I don't know if you can put those together, but to me there seems to be some possibility that within this physiological structure that we call a brain, there's something going on that is way out there. That is yeah, but again, you're, you're talking about things like uh, uh, I mean, that, that, that's fine. Still, somewhere between the first order, the second order, the third order, the fourth order, and or the fifth or whatever, the phenomenon there has to be a qualitative inversion. And if you can't explain that qualitative inversion in terms of the earlier phenomenal state, if it just happens, then it's magic. If it's not magic, then you have to say that we were missing something implicit. And, uh, and, and then, how do you go about that? It's not by assuming emergence, it's by, by, by doing away with the notion of irreducible emergence and presuming uh, a rational potency that is only expressed um, you know, you mentioned quantum theory, the whole, the whole issue of, of, or the, it doesn't have to be quantum theory, as you say, like you know, shifting sands. Someone like David Bohm, of course, will argue, try to argue that, that, that there are hidden variables that make even the quantum realm every bit as determinate as the Newtonian uh, mechanical realm. But I, I think that's probably wrong. I mean, I think Bell's theorem has been proved mathematically, I think there are any number of reasons. But all of that, no matter how you look at that, you're still within a realm that's describable, whether it's potential or actual, whether it's determinate or indeterminate, of third person processes. And so you can easily get lost in the beautiful intricacy of that and miss the very simple issue that the phenomenology of consciousness is still the phenomenology of something that is qualitatively different and that can't be reconciled with third person description. Now, I'm not saying that mind, I mean, I've never, mind and brain are separable for us, that's true. I'm not a Cartesian. I don't believe that the mind is a ghost inhabiting a machine. That's the point I'm trying to make. But the terms of that relationship are not mechanical. They are not irreducibly emergent mechanical forces. And so where does the priority lie? I think by the time we get to the end of my argument, the priority lies with consciousness itself. So, um, I don't know if that answers your question adequately. But. Well, I, I think that <clears throat> what was hitting me was the possibility that there was something going on that was so far beyond any rational materialistic explanation that there's there was room for God. Oh, well, okay, yeah, sure, fine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do believe that what's going on is beyond a materialist explanation. I believe materialism is a superstition, and one that has to be chased away uh, if you want a truly scientific or logical picture of reality. But materialism is a methodological decision, had its, had its uses. I mean, it's good to know, you know, the body may not really be a machine. Organisms are machines. They don't behave like machines. They grow, they change, they repair themselves. They have a, uh, a certain kind of dynamic structure that's more than just the arrangement of unrelated parts. But uh, 
isolating certain functions in the body, treating them as the machine, it allows us, for instance, to develop medical treatments that can save lives. So I don't, I'm not against uh, methodological, inductive method. I'm just uh, saying that using that as a metaphysical explanation of things like consciousness is, is always going to be a dead end. Hi, uh, thanks for coming, of course. Um, my question is related to your, uh, sorry, the place you're coming from. It seems to be mostly philosophical, but then you, you obviously think it has implications for the scientific as well. Um, just comparing different scientific theories, and there's some of the criteria you would use to evaluate rival theories. Um, one of those would be experimental fecundity. So, like, like how can we? What does this lead to? Like, can we test it? Can we? develop new models based on this. Is your is your approach open to the charge that it's sort of mystical and uh, religious and not really scientific? Or are, are you conscious of this conversation? Uh, yes. Consciousness then is a phenomenon. Okay. Can you describe that phenomenon through a scrupulous reduction to its most basic uh, Parts, not parts, but most, most basic characteristics. Yes, you can do that. Is that description? I mean, consciousness is a rather conspicuous phenomenon. It's not. It's, I mean, wait, wait. Is all is that then reconcilable with a mechanistic uh, picture of matter? No. So that model is not capable of describing the whole of reality. Remember, the fecundity of any experimental method is the fecundity of producing results that specifically correspond to the questions you're asking in the manner of asking the question. You know, read your Heisenberg on this. Um, it, 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 you, if, if you're trying uh, to build a house and you use wood and nails and plaster and stone and you produce a house, uh, then you've achieved a house because you've used the correct method, but that doesn't mean that there is no such thing as a cave <laughs> or a palace, right? Uh, it, it's uh, it, 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 so again in a purely non and I've no by the way the word mystical doesn't frighten me, but I mean in this case uh, I'm talking about a phenomenon that is universally observable and that can be described with, with a very very precise and scrupulous phenomenology and has been described. Uh, in Western tradition, consciousness, descriptions of consciousness emerge somewhat late, although other aspects of mind, like reason and things, tend to, to be more fully worked out. Uh, but we have descriptions of, I mean, really extraordinarily precise phenomenological descriptions of such things as willing or or mistaking one thing for another, or intentionality, uh, say in Indian philosophical tradition going back several centuries before Christ. So, I mean, it is observable, it's describable. There's nothing mystical about that. It's a phenomenon of nature that doesn't fit a certain model of nature, therefore the model is false. Thanks. Um, thank you for your talk. I was um, wondering how you see the relationship between mind and consciousness, just because a lot of people who are studying mind are interested in things like the anatomist tradition, with very, very simple contentless minds that probably we wouldn't say are conscious, or with artificial minds that are clearly mechanistic because um, they're computers and thus aren't consciousness. So I was wondering. Are you, how your conception of mind is... Well, we have to define what you mean by mind. I mean, there's no such thing as an artificial mind. There couldn't possibly be, but, but I mean, it, it, in that sense, because, uh, I mean, I, in fact, but I didn't. I brought here, just in case I decided I didn't want to give this talk, I brought it to another talk on computational models of mind, but then I decided that that, that I'd heard it too often. Um, <laughs> Um, by mind, uh, I'm, I'm speaking at the, at the simplest level of intentionality, unity of apprehension, first-person perspective, qualitative awareness, 
and in its uh, in, in, as enfolded within intentionality, the possibility of the syntax of reason, that is, and of language, that is, of um, of arriving at results that can't be the consequence of the brute juxtaposition or the, or the brute sequence of, of electrochemical events, but that are actually dictated by their semantic content. Like, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates, I've lost the thread. <laughs> so that's what I mean by mind. Um, there's a, you know, contentless mind is already a problem because mind, as I understand it, is not a thing but an act and that act is inherently intentional, so if it's utterly contentless, there's no act, there's no mind. Artificial mind is, uh, is, is just a category mistake. I mean, it, it seems to me there, you know, just what you have are algorithmic imitations of functions that, uh, sadly, no matter how often we repeat the Turing test, and no matter how close we get to something that looks like it, it, it passes the Turing test, will ultimately not be intention of consciousness. Although, it, it, I'm not saying it's, it's entirely, I mean, if a machine became conscious, I wouldn't have any prejudices against it. But I still would assume it did not become conscious as a result of the emergent, as an emergence simply from its physical systems. Uh, Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think that, uh, see, again, all these words uh, have been used differently and variously in the tradition. I mean, by soul, do we mean sikhi, the way it's used in the first century when the New Testament was written, when it means a life principle and panevma, spirit. For myself, though, I mean, I, I, I'll just, you know, uh, I think all of reality is reducible to consciousness another name for which I'd be happy to use, spirit. Soul is a, uh, is a question of, uh, you know, how, how you use that word is going to, I think, uh, have to remain specific and local to, to, to context. I mean, sometimes one means soul in the Aristotelian sense, which is just a particular form of life which animates a particular substance, or soul is used sometimes to mean consciousness or mind or spirit or soul can mean any number of things and, and I think even in Christian tradition there's no one language of the soul um, so I'm sorry I can't be more uh, helpful in that regard. thank you that, that was helpful maybe just one more oh, just one more question <laughs> and, <laughs> and deferential um, well, only the differential. And call me your eminence if you like. I'd rather not. That's okay. Having um, found yourself, having <laughs> found myself to be conscious, and you seem to be as well, um, there also seem to be other entities significantly more conscious than I am, um, other humans, angels, maybe your dog Roland. Um, I was wondering how you Roland recommend. Roland does put us all to shame. So. <laughs> I was wondering how you recommend becoming more conscious. Like these other entities in Roland. Don't think Republican. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the present political regime is not in my mind. Uh, mostly because I have a mind. And it doesn't. Um, uh, I'm more conscious. I don't even know how to say. I mean, that's, that's a different kind of question, isn't it? I mean, I do believe that. You're right that there's, there are levels of consciousness that, that are experienced by uh, uh, disciplines of, of contemplation. I mean that the saints and sadhus and all sorts of persons who who, who uh, uh, seriously uh, 
undertake uh, disciplines of the mind and try to detach it from, uh, you know, like Evagrius politics is about detach it from the loyisme, the chains of, of little logisms that draw it sort of distract it from itself, that try to return to itself, that, that, that there is a way of entering into that uh, state of, in which consciousness knows itself more at its ground. And that ground, obviously, I believe, is a god. So, um, you, you, so you, you, you can become a contemplative. But I also think that there, there are, uh, I think also, the practice of the arts, actually, is a moment of, you know, in the arts, we be, either in the appreciation or the creation, we, we become detached from momentary, uh, from momentary distractions and come nearer uh, the source of the sheer gratuity of being and of, and of the spirit's openness to it. So I think there's not just one path. Um, if you still could have been more deferential in asking that question. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow is the first step. I think we should wind up there to save, uh, to save David's voice. Thank you very, very much. And thank you very, very much for coming. It's been a it's been an interesting afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, David.